Today on The Global African, we'll talk about the impact of neoliberalism on black politics in the United States. We'll also discuss the recently completed United Nations Climate Conference known as COP21. That's the day on The Global African. I'm your host, Bill Fletcher. Thanks for joining us again. I'm not a businessman. I'm a businessman. Our next guest argues that this Jay-Z lyric summarizes a shift in black politics over the last several decades. Neoliberalism, the idea that the market knows best, has dominated our system of economics as well as our politics. Individuals are being made to think of themselves as brands responsible for developing their own human capital. Hallowed institutions like schools and churches increasingly behave like businesses, prioritizing market values like production and efficiency. This is all in an era where, non-coincidentally, we are facing historically high levels of income inequality. On this segment, we're going to look at neoliberalism's effect on black politics and pop culture, as well as the politics of hustling. So stay tuned. We're joined by uh, Professor Lester Spence. Professor Spence is an associate professor of political science and Africana studies at Johns Hopkins University. He specializes in the study of black racial and urban politics and is the author of the recently published book, Knocking the Hustle Against the Neoliberal Turn in Black Politics. And that's what we're going to be addressing today. Welcome, doctor. Thank you for having me. Oh, our <laughs> pleasure. Absolutely. Welcome back. It's good to be here. It's really good to be here. So um, I'm excited about this book. The, but let's start with terms, because in most of the rest of the world, people understand the term neoliberalism. In the United States, for a variety of reasons, people don't. Yeah. Uh, so when I'm talking about neoliberalism, uh, or when most of the rest of the world talks about neoliberalism, what they're talking about is kind of a set of institutional arrangements public policies and kind of common sense ideas that proposes that the market be the standard by which every institution and every aspect of human life be organized around, right? Mm -hmm. So when I'm talking about this to, to brothers and sisters, to black brothers and sisters, the, the term I'll use or the, the line I use is from uh, Diamonds from Sierra Leone, Re Sierra Leone. The remix with uh, Kanye West and Jay Z, and he has a line in there where he says, "I'm not a businessman. I'm a business man. Watch me handle my business." Damn, is that idea that individuals should try to structure their lives to be as entrepreneurial as possible, uh, and to become something akin to enterprises? Similarly, if you look at schools, churches, um, governments, the idea is that they should be structured. Um, like businesses, right? So it's the destruction of any real notion of society. It's the destru destruction of what we think of as a so the so society, and it's the destruction of the concept of the public, right? The whole idea of a public good kind of falls out. So, um, you know, we can think about uh, people like Milton Friedman, mm -hmm. uh, the economist is one of the architects of that. Uh, what about in black America? What, what happened... What are you focusing on that, that took place in black America? So what happens in general, like around, what, late 60s, early 70s, the world economy the, in, the, in developed countries basically falls out uh, or bottoms out. And a whole set of policies that basically provide it for a safety net um, in the United States and other countries, those policies get, uh, get posed as having caused the problem. So what we need are a new suite of policies that basically get people to take responsibility for their own stuff. You know, welfare is replaced by workfare. Um, you know, uh, supply uh, or supply side economics, or the idea that we need to significantly cut, 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 cut taxes. That we need to restructure governments. That we need to make cities more entrepreneurial. That gets rolled out. That happens at the same time that we see uh, African Americans or African Americans in the United States case actually gain a suite of rights and they take control of cities like Detroit, uh, Washington DC, Gary, but the bottom falls out of those cities, 
right? Like mm -hmm. the moment black people take power is the moment that uh, these policies begin to be rolled out. And in fact, in some ways, because black people take power, they can be used as the excuse for why we need kind of neoliberal policies. And in, now black people in the United States are in a lot of ways just like people in the United States in general. So some of the same forces that cause uh, the neoliberal turn to take hold in America, the United States broadly, takes hold in black communities in the same way. And you see it in, um, in the actions and ideas of many of the first and really the second and third wave of black mayors. You see it in the growth of the prosperity gospel in uh, black church communities, and you see it in a few other places as well. Explain, because our audience is global, prosperity, cool, uh, uh, by, uh, prosperity theology, what, what yeah. is that? So the prosperity gospel uh, basically takes the Bible and transforms it into an entrepreneurial self-help guide. And the idea being is that if you follow the line, if you follow the Bible, if you follow the precepts of Jesus in the New Testament, not only will you be spiritually wealthy, but you will be materially wealthy. Right. So it's a, it's a, it's a 21st century version of like Daddy Grace and uh, yes yeah 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 and and that and that's really really important. Thank you for bringing that because the thing is is even though it's neoliberalism, the neo implying new, a number of these ideas are ideas that are recirculating. They're not circulated in exactly the same way. The 21st century isn't just 1920 warmed over, but those elements are, are very similar. So. The, uh, the, the neoliberal economics uh, or neoliberal project mm -hmm. as implemented in black America, uh, do you see that as having, uh, that essentially defeated the prior, the, uh, let's, let's call it the, like the civil rights reformer agenda? Is that what, basically what happens? Uh, no, uh, I would actually argue that it kind of, um, in, infects it, right? Explain what uh, that is. So if we think about the neoliberal project as a class project, and, and that's what it is kind of broadly, right? But focusing on it as a specific class project in, uh, in the United States among black people and actually being exported other places. There's an element of the civil rights project that was about uh, reducing racial discrimination. Mm -hmm. But if you think about where those gains are really concentrated, they're really concentrated amongst black folk who are highly educated, black folk who are professional, you know, black folk like me. Mm -hmm. uh, and in as much as that neoliberal class project is about kind of enhancing the ability of black, uh, of folk in that top 10%, top 15% to kind of live lives it's easy to articulate kind of a neoliberal civil rights project that suggests that um, that we should concentrate, we should give black people um, who already have the capacity to be entrepreneurial more resources for them to do so, and then cut people who you know can't pull their pants up, right, or people who can't stop having babies or whatever. You know, you cut them off. Um, you cut them off like at the knees. There was a very provocative point that you make uh, in discussing this book, and I smiled when I read it. You said that this book is both a response to Cornel West's Race Matters and David Harvey's Brief History of Neoliberalism. And uh, of course, Race Matters was a very popular book when it came out, uh, and Cornell is associated with anti-poverty, progressiveness, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but what's your, you have a critique, you have a very deep critique. Yeah, um, and I had this critique back when I was a kid, right? So Race Matters, really quickly, what it does, what it's really good at doing, it's a really, really, really short book, right? And it, within that short book, it communicates a lot of dense ideas about uh, black leadership, about black politics, et cetera. Right? Mm -hmm. And I wanted to see if I could do that with good politics. The challenge with that book, uh, there are a couple of challenges. One challenge is what he articulates as the most important problem facing black America is black nihilism. This is right after the Rodney King riots, right? Explain for what black nihilism, what does that mean? Oh, black nihilism is basically the, 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 the pervasive loss of love 
like kind of self-love in black communities that comes basically after kind of the the post and after the bottom falls out of the economy starting in the 70s mm -hmm. taking shape in the 80s and the reagan uh, what we used to call the reagan bush era mm -hmm. now the challenge <laughs> so one way to think about it being trifling is that black nihilism as an intellectual idea has done more harm to black people than crack <laughs> right in that it's a provocative point if you argue uh -huh. you know what are the politics that come as a result of arguing that in the wake of the LA rebellion this most significant problem with black people is that we don't kind of love ourselves enough um, the the politics that come from that is the politics of therapy right uh, instead of the politics of organizing Right. Mm -hmm. and, and as far as analyzing where our problems are, our, our, uh, when we're analyzing, we're not analyzing political economy. We're not taking institutions seriously. We're not talking about the structural forces that's decimated unions, that's, uh, that's uh, brought the red line into the 21st century. We're not talking about any of that stuff. What we're talking about is what do we have to do to, uh, you know, where is the love? Right. Like that old school song. Where mm -hmm. is the love? Right. right? right. So that's. What I wanted to, that's why, that was my response to Cornell West. Now, on the other side, you have um, David Harvey. And David Harvey, his work on neoliberalism is really, really, really important. Mm -hmm. It's incredibly important. But if you read that book, right, you, there's no mention of racial politics in there. Mm -hmm. And you can't talk about the turn towards neoliberalism in the United States, at the very least, without talking about racial politics. It's not possible, mm -hmm. right? It's not that class creates the conditions for racial politics. It's that class and racial politics work together. Mm -hmm. There's a reason why whites who suffer tremendously from the neoliberal turn consistently vote for it, mm -hmm. right? Right. Uh, um, and Harvey totally ignores that. So I wanted to kind of take, I wanted to talk about the way race kind of Racial politics creates the conditions by which the neoliberal turn can take place, but then hone really and drill down deep in what this means for black politics, right? And then the responses that black people have to make that already take for granted that black people kind of love one another. Let me ask one other question, and I actually have many other questions, uh, but I, uh, I can only ask one. And that has to do with the way this has been, this book has been published. You did not go to an academic press. Yeah. Um, can you say a little bit about how and why you made that decision and what the publisher's thinking is? Yeah, so I went with Punctum Press. Punctum is a small, radical press, uh, independent, uh, and it has really, really liberal di digital rights management. So for those of you who are interested, if you, are, uh, you know, right now it's gonna cost like $5 for the PDF, and you can give that PDF away, and then in six months, the PDF will be free. Right. Because I'm writing this book to get the ideas out. Right. I'm not writing this book to get massive honorarium checks. We're in a moment now where you can get massively paid for this type of stuff. I'm not writing this book to, you know, I wanted to see if I could kind of reproduce, take the writing of the book and the publishing of the book as a political project. Right. So thinking about the, the academic aspects, I'm a car carrying academic. I don't consider myself a scholar activist. That's another term I have a problem with. Um, scholarship matters. Right. But the question is, is how do we create more space for the types of political work that needs to be done within political science, within sociology? Right. Mm -hmm. So. To a certain extent, this is also an academic experiment. That is, if I can publish this and actually get academic, academic benefits from it, then that increases the capability of some assistant professor who comes behind me or some kid who's thinking about graduate school to actually do the same thing, right? Because too often with tenure, uh, tenure becomes kind of a, a, kind of a, a, a golden noose so to speak, and it kind of truncates your ability to think broadly because once you get tenure, you tend to want to just reproduce the stuff that the academy wants, mm. right? And I wanted to see if I could do something that traveled broadly to, to, to write something that created more space within the academy and then something that wasn't necessarily about me, you know, me getting paid. That's not really what this project is about. Dr. Spence, thank you for joining us. And this is, uh, I'm, I'm really looking forward to this getting out. 
because this is one of the central debates that we've got to have in black America. And all too often, uh, we shy away from it. So I want to thank you very much for not only joining us, but for doing this. Oh, thank you so much. This has been dope. Thank you very much for joining us for this segment of The Global African. I'm your host, Bill Fletcher. We'll be back in a moment. The United Nations 21st Conference of Parties, what's called COP21, recently concluded in Paris, France. COP21 has nearly universal membership of 195 parties, and it will be the first time in 20 years that the United Nations negotiations are aiming to create a universal, legally binding agreement. Leaders of the conference discussed the decarburization of the global economy by keeping three quarters of all known fossil fuels in the ground. This action could reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 40 to 70 percent by 2050 with an aim of completely eliminating greenhouse gas emissions by 2100 of the 22nd century. Germany and France have spearheaded a push for a reform to lower the proposed threshold for temperature rising. Initially, it was stated that the globe should not warm above 2 degrees Celsius, but discussions are currently taking place to lower the aim to 1.5 degrees Celsius. This difference will be the difference between the security of 1.5 million people's lives currently inhabited on small islands who face bigger threats from global warming. Saudi Arabia leads a group of countries who are trying to weaken global climate language. As the world's largest oil producers, producing 21 million barrels a day, the country has a vested interest in maintaining the status quo. We're going to pursue this critical discussion in the next segment. We're joined in this segment by two environmental justice activists. We have Wahela Johns, who is with the Navajo Nation. Her work with the Black Mesa Water Coalition has led to groundbreaking legislative victories for groundwater protection, green jobs, and environmental justice in northern Arizona. And she was at the COP21 conference in Paris. Also joining us, Bill Gallegos has been active for many decades in the Chicano liberation and environmental justice movements. Bill is currently active in the Building Equity and Alignment Initiative, a collaborative project between grassroots environmental justice organizations, green groups, and philanthropy, whose goal is to build the capacity and leadership of the grassroots sector. I want to welcome you both to the Global African. Thank you, Bill. Thank you. So let's start with this conference in Paris. Well, you were there. Uh, yes. What, what, what was your analysis? I mean, did anything come out of this and what were your expectations in going in? Um, I went with the North American Indigenous um, Peoples Delegation, which, um, you know, is about 30, I, I would say 15 people, um, but maybe close to 50 Indigenous peoples from North America that attended. And, um, you know, the, the, the main push for us has been, was pretty clear um, before leaving, was um, making sure that the rights of indigenous peoples are included in the agreement. Um, and uh, so that, that, that was kind of the main um, reason why we attended is that to, to show um, states and countries that, you know, the rights of indigenous people acknowledging it and respecting the rights of indigenous peoples is um, something that is needed, you know, to be in a binding agreement and recognized. So that was our kind of main focus for the, for the past two weeks. Bill, um, what expectations did you have of Paris and were they met? Well, actually, I felt like this was going to be largely a public relations exercise for the big polluting uh, countries, especially the United States and Europe and some of the large industrialized capitalist countries. Um, uh, Copenhagen was just an unmitigated disaster. It was strictly a advertising opportunity for the fossil fuel companies. But I think because there is a recognition that the climate crisis is so severe that they had to come up with something. So I think there is going to be some kind of agreement that comes out of Paris, but I think it is largely going to be a meaningless agreement that, if anything, 
uh, ratifies only market-based solutions uh, to the climate crisis, such as cap and trade programs, such as the deforestation programs that uh, Wahila referred to, the RED program, which is basically a program for removing people, indigenous peoples from the lands um, as offset programs for large polluting corporations. For example, the um, the large industrialized countries have said that they have created a climate fund of $100 billion, but the countries of the global south have said, well, this we haven't seen it. What is this, an IOU? We're not seeing anything. And finally, the United States says, well, we'll come up with an agreement that says we'll give you a small one-time payment. And, and they said they'd commit $800 million a year, which is nothing. Uh, in return, you have to give up all claims to climate reparations or any kinds of resources from the large polluting countries to help you uh, develop a sustainable energy economy. So I think what's going to come out of this is something that exacerbates the climate crisis and especially puts indigenous peoples and countries of the global south and coastal communities at increasing risk for climate disaster over the next decade. You use a term that some people are not familiar with. Give me a two second on cap and trade. What does that mean? It's a market-based program which says, um, rather than reducing your emissions, and I'll give you an example, uh, the organization that I'm affiliated with, Communities for a Better Environment, has been organizing in Richmond, California, where there's a 3,000-acre oil refinery run by the Chevron Co Corporation. California has a, uh, a greenhouse gas emissions legislation called AB32, and for all industrial sources of emission, they come under the cap-and-trade program. So rather than making Chevron reduce its emissions, it's the largest uh, industrial greenhouse gas emitter in the state of California. Rather than having to reduce their emissions, they're able to buy offsets. So they'll say, OK, we're going to plant 3,000 acres of palm oil trees in Brazil rather than reduce emissions here in Richmond. So actually, since that uh, greenhouse gas legislation has passed, Chevron has expanded their operations. They've increased their emissions, both, both the immediately toxic emissions, such as mercury and benzene and nit nitrous oxides, but also their greenhouse gas emissions. So this is what a cap and trade program allows you to do. It allows you to buy your way out of reducing your emissions. And of course, they don't put oil refineries in rich white communities. They put them in poor communities of color or indigenous communities. And that's who pays the price for these kinds of market mechanisms. Wehela, when you were talking about the, uh, the delegation that you were a part of, um, one of the things that I was curious about is what is the relationship between the indigenous environmental justice activists and the rest of the environmental movement? Are there contradictions that exists? Um, you know, as indigenous peoples, you know, worldwide, I think um, we hold so much knowledge um, of our land and our water and our territories, and that's what makes us um, unique. And we have a sacred responsibility too to all elements in our Mother Earth. And um, you know, we we pray to nature, and I think um, in in that respect, it's you know we. That's who we are and very different from, I think, many other uh, cultures. And I and with environmentalism, um, a big difference in um, how we how we move forward in um, the kind of livelihoods that we want to live is very sustainable and in unison with seasons and in unison with the solstices, you know, and I think that that um, that's that's our strength. And I, I, and we know as communities that are on the front lines of, you know, uh, like Bill said of extraction, we, we bear the brunt of climate change, but also we bear the brunt of the uh, polluters, the people that have, um, you know, did the, you know, mining coal, mining oil, mining gas, it's all in our communities. So how does that orientation differ from others in the environmental movement? Well, I, I think it's, um, you know, uh, what Wahile was saying is really true, that the environmental justice movement in this country has to acknowledge that it began with the indigenous struggle 500 years ago against colonialism. 
And that's those are the shoulders and that's the tradition on which our movement rests and which we have to respect. And I think the the big green organizations come out of a very different tradition. It's a conservation tradition, a tradition rooted in the more privileged sectors of society. And their, um, their general orientation has been to accommodate uh, and work with uh, the existing status quo. So their focus is a lot on lobbying, on legal advocacy, and um, they've often been willing to accept the corporate framework for approaching solutions to the to the environmental and climate crisis in this country. And this has caused significant contradictions. So it was the big green groups in, in California, for example, some of the big green organizations, uh, such as the Environmental Defense Fund, that were the strongest advocates for market-based solutions to the um, for the greenhouse gas legislation in California, even though the environmental justice community said there's a better way to do this through a tax program, through taxing the polluters, to regulating the polluters, which would guarantee emission reductions, especially in those communities that bear the, the heaviest burden of the fossil fuel infrastructure, and would ensure that the, the big polluters pay for the cost of this transition to clean energy. And we were defeated uh, in that effort, and largely the effort, the cover, the environmental cover for that was some of the big green organizations okay. who said, well, you have to look at the bigger picture. And we said, well, in Richmond, the bigger picture is people can't breathe. The bigger picture is horrendous cancer rates. The bigger picture is every kid has an asthma inhaler. So the picture we care about is human beings and Mother Earth, and that's where the contradictions have often come in. I want to thank Walila Johns and Bill Gallegos for joining us for this segment of The Global African. Thank you so much, William. Okay. Thank you. All right. You all take care. And thank you very much for joining us for this episode of The Global African. I'm your host, Bill Fletcher. Appreciate you joining us. Mm-hmm.